Intent is about how you feel. Impact is about how you make others feel. No one was sharing strategies. It was almost like if I share my strategy with you, you're going to then steal my strategy and go after that that tight talent pool and we're going to lose our competitive advantage. And that just started sounding very similar to me to how software development was done before the advent of open source. And so I just thought about it. I said, well, if we collaborate on code, why can't we collaborate on inclusion? Welcome in. My name is Lo, and I'm a developer relations specialist at Sanity.io. And I'm joined by my co-host, Rizelle Scarlett, who is a developer advocate at GitHub. And you're listening to Human Readable, a monthly series where we discuss a new approach to learning how to foster and maintain diverse, inclusive, and welcoming tech communities. Each month, we will be joined by many surprising guests who will offer insight on community organizing, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts, conflict resolution, radical communication, and human behavior. Want to find out how a kindergarten teacher, musicians, artists, social workers, and more can help you moderate your virtual community, tune in. Human Readable is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor in developer-first startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you would like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Lois Wren. That is L-O-W-I-S-R-E-N. All right, let's get into our topic with our special guest. We're talking about good intentions versus good impact. Roselle, do you want to introduce our guest today? Yeah, I'm happy to. So Demetrius is my coworker and a good friend of mine. Demetrius is the Senior Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging at GitHub. She's responsible for leading the company's long-term strategy across four pillars, which are people, platform, policy, and philanthropy. And her work includes aligning diversity, inclusion, and belonging to the company's global expansion, growth, and business strategy. That also includes the plan for future footprint of its workforce. Welcome, Demetrius. Thank you so much for being on our show. So we're talking about good intentions versus good impact. And just to get started, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think the difference between good intentions versus good impact is when it comes to DEI and tech or tech communities. Thank you so much. That's a great question. And before I get started, I just want to say thank you both so much for having me, Rizelle. You know, I would do anything that you ask me to and show up wherever. <laughs> and as part of my bio, I have to acknowledge that along with Lauren, I am a proud graduate of North Carolina A&T State University. So had to get that Aggie pride out the way. Yes, Aggie pride, <laughs> blue and yellow. <laughs> so back to the question, um, you know, good intentions versus good impact. If you really want to think about it in its simplest terms, and this is for DEI in tech and other industries or just in general, intent is about how you feel. Impact is about how you make others feel. I think the issue with intent versus impact really comes into play when there is a repeated pattern of behavior, whether it's by an individual or it's common knowledge and that individual should actually know better. It starts to feel like when someone says they are sorry to you over and over again, but their behavior doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Yes. How this plays out in DEI is when they diminish the impact by hiding behind statements like, we should trust by default or assume positive intent. Mm-hmm. After a while, when you keep hearing that over and over, it just becomes another form of gaslighting. Yeah. Basically saying, I did something, but you aren't hurt by it because I didn't intend for it to hurt you. Yeah, here you all sitting over here like, dang it, I was harmed by that, wasn't I? Yeah. And then you start questioning it. Then you start excusing it. And after a while, this is what becomes the underpinning of a toxic relationship, a toxic team or a toxic organization altogether. Right. And I think that's what starts that like sort of, like you said, that like toxicity, but also that sort of plausible, I call it plausible deniability, right? So you don't, which is sort of akin to gaslighting where you're like, you question, you start to question everything around you, everything you think. And that cuts into your confidence about the things you're trying to do, your work tasks and all of that stuff. And then comes that narrative that you were just speaking about, about, oh, trust by default. 
if you're already coming from a foundation where that's not your truth, and then you're constantly hearing that, and then you circle back and have an experience like what we're just talking about now, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You're never going to report anything that's happening to you. You're not going to say anything about when you see something happening to someone else. And all of that stuff contributes to like burnout, I feel like, and all of that stuff. And that's when people end up leaving your organization and you may not even know why. Correct. They're surprised when when someone leaves. Like, how did this happen? We didn't even know this was going on. Yeah, yeah you were you did such great work. Why are you leaving? <laughs> and it's like, well, uh, we're basically in a lifetime movie network relationship. Like, I didn't see it, but we were for years. I gotta go. And, and then even you know the more you know ironic part is that now they expect for you to tell all about this toxic behavior in your exit interview. I don't even feel psychologically safe enough to do that. And so then they get this narrative that you left because you got an amazing opportunity somewhere else or it was for more pay. No, it actually wasn't because of that. It was because of the toxic environment that I still don't even feel safe to tell you about on my way out the door. Right. Yes. Why are y'all speaking my truth? I left a job and they were like, we know it's because you don't want to be a software engineer anymore. I'm like, no, because <laughs> y'all are toxic, but <laughs> go off. Yes. Exactly. It's like, no, I don't want to be your software engineer anymore. I like mm-hmm. that a lot. I love it. I love that. <laughs> So let me let me ask you a question, Demetrius. Like, how do you make a positive impact at your job? Roselle, I think you are a witness to this, but I talk to people <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Like, I talk a lot. I'm constantly talking. When someone asks my 70-year-old mom and dad what I do for a living, they literally say, she talks a lot for a living. <laughs> like, that's how they describe what I do. Or how can I put this in tech terms? I would say my feedback loop is strong. Like that's something that we can all think about. Now, of course, I'm always looking at data. I'm setting measurements for success. But I also make sure that I'm reading between the numbers or seeking to understand what the data might not be telling me. Mm -hmm. I probably drive people batty with this because I don't like to do numbers for numbers sake. And people love to play the diversity game with numbers, right? Like thousands of people that we've helped here. We got hundreds of new hires for this and all those things. But you know what? I can actually stand up a program pretty quickly that 10,000 people would get access to. I can do that all day, every day. But I actually like more of the ripple effect strategy. I like going deep and having that transformational effect with a few that will turn into having an impact on a few more and so on. I like to go for those exponential results that generations can feel. But the downside to that is, you know, I'll I'll be quite honest with you. It is slow. Mm -hmm. Like you are doing it, you know, for a few people it's slow and engineers, we don't like slow. But we've been playing the numbers games for years. Right. Like think about after the murder of George Floyd, you had companies like we're going to put 50 million dollars for racial equity. We're going to do 100 million for that. We're going to, you know, upscale a million people here, black and brown faces and all those good things. And then you'll see those big numbers going out. But then we keep looking at the numbers in tech and it's still 4% black. Right. Like after all those big numbers keep being reported, when you go down and drill to that bottom line number, it's not moving. So I always say, we got like, what is insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? That's why I was like, we have to look at a different approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's where I like that, that, that slow, that intentional, that going deep versus, you know, the breadth of it. Yeah. And I think that's a really amazing point that you just made, because I come to tech from the social work world, right? I was a social worker before I started doing this and particularly in harm reduction, right? And so harm reduction is all about slow, but methodical behavioral change, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I'm thinking about trying to make, you know, the tech community that I'm involved in, the Sandy community more inclusive or reaching out to organizations that are doing this work, I'm thinking about us, you know, getting in there and not just doing one activity, but staying with that same organization for a long period of time and actually establishing a relationship. And that is directly mirrored to all the things that I did when I was in, you know, physical communities. Mm -hmm. You take a group of people and you slowly move through this series of like actions. 
Yeah. But I think what, uh, yes, and I shouldn't have said, but a lot of organizations are always, regardless of what they're doing, they're looking for that ROI, that return on investment. Mm. I talk about this all the time. And I say this humbly being from North Carolina a and a computer science major. When a company wants to check the box that they've gone to an HBCU, a historically black college and university, it's so easy for them to go to a and Morehouse, Spelman, Howard, Hampton, FAMU, those big schools. Right. And they're like one-stop shopping almost. We went there, let's grab as many as we can and we're gone. Yeah. They will ignore the smaller schools. And Lauren, because we're here in North Carolina, I'll say the Shaw Universities of the world, the St. Augustines, the North Carolina Centrals, the Fayetteville State, and I'm just naming those that are right here in our area. Because they're like, well, they only have a few students over there. So it's not worth us actually spending the money, sending people down for us to maybe get one. Let's just play that numbers a game and just go with that big pond so we can just grab a lot. Versus I'm thinking, what would happen? And I'm so glad the Red Hat has done that. If you take one school, one company, and you decide to go deep and long with them. Right. If you do that and you work on their infrastructure, you work on all these things, you create pathways for those students. It's in turn going to allow the school to increase enrollment and increase the number of students. That's how you increase the talent pool. You don't all compete and go in the same pond and fish for that same group of students. That then feeds into that narrative around it's so it's only a few of them. It's so competitive to get them. No, you're just kind of just going in the same place. Expand your network, expand where you go and who you know, and stop with that return on investment numbers game. Yeah. In business, is about that bottom line. And so that's when you have to have that commitment to doing it differently. Absolutely. And I feel like a lot of times there's a situation where a lot of these tech companies and people who are doing sort of this like tech community work, they don't realize that that comes off even as performative, right? This sort of doing this, like this, these huge sort of catch all things. It's like, we know what you're doing. We see you. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in like their minds, I feel like their perception is totally different than I think how they're actually being perceived. Again, it's like intentions versus impact. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. But so I wanted to ask you about, are there any moments where you tried to make a good impact in your work, but it had the opposite effect or either like some lessons learned that you could talk about? Yeah. um, One in particular, um, you know, there's one thing that I used to be a big champion of that I think are meant to be really good DEI, you know, a DEI initiative in an organization. And there's some good in it, but there's also some very negative impact. And that concept is around hiring for potential. Mm -hmm. This is when a company hires a candidate who may not have the necessary skills or technical skills or whatever when they start, but they possess the personal traits that make them a great fit for the organization. And even though you can't see it, I just put great fit in in air quotes because that's a problematic term as well. But I just want to... Yes, let's not... Oh. (laughs) The intent behind hiring for potential is that the employers now are giving someone who otherwise will be probably in the no pile, right? Like when you see their resume, nope, we're not going to move forward with them. But now you're giving them a chance. They're going to pave the way for them to be successful. And then they're going to have these, you know, uber loyal employees. This also helps address things like the stats around, you know, men apply for a job when they meet only 60% of the qualifications, but women only apply if you meet 100% of them. So if you have this hiring for a potential initiative, it kind of lowers that barrier there as well. But here's why hiring for potential is problematic and can be harmful if not done correctly and with intention. One, This concept only works if you have the proper support structures in place for that new hire. Yes, mentorship. That's what was in my mind. I'm seeing a lot of small, under-resourced companies do this hiring for potential. And quite honestly, it's really a lazy way to source candidates against what they feel is a tight talent market. There's those air quotes again. So they hire them into these orgs, these folks that, you know, still need to grow a little bit and get upskill in their roles. But they push them out there and it's like sink or swim. They're starting to say they need to work hard. They need to take the initiative and go out and learn on their own. It's a setup for failure and or burnout from the start. Yeah. Then you add in the punishment gap. 
where women and people of color are often punished more harshly for the same mistakes compared to others. So you set us up in this, you know, structure and then you don't even allow us the opportunity to fail. You know, then you'll find these, you know, new hires, not hires for potential. They're quickly on PIPs, performance improvement plan. Yes. And then they're ultimately yes. ushered around the organization. And then this is where it gets even worse. That's when, you know, these companies and management and leadership, they start having conversation like, well, we tried. Or when you start talking about this diversity, you then have to have these conversations. But we can't lower the quality bar. You know, all those oh, things they felt like they lowered the quality <laughs> bar in order to sake to get diversity. But really, you had a setup. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. but, but I have to say all is not lost because there are success stories. And oftentimes... Here's what happens with those success stories when you do have a, you know, a hiring for potential and they are able to navigate and, and, you know, improve and get and do what they need to do. Then it becomes this never ending debt. We gave you a chance. So you should be grateful to us. You should be grateful you have a job. We hired you and no one else probably wouldn't have. So then therefore, when that that hire starts experiencing things, they don't even feel comfortable with saying anything because they gave you a shot when no one else did. Right. No one wants to feel that way. Yeah. Like it is never ending. How much do I owe you? You're not promoting me now. You're not giving me any type of raises or compensation for this extra work because in their mind, I'm constantly trying to, you know, make up for this favor that they did for us. And so that's when hiring for potential gets to be problem. It can be good. I've rarely mm-hmm. seen Companies itself or really, really mature companies do it well and have what they need in order to grow those folks and have a successful program. Yes. I just want to say I'm going to I'm going to be using that because I have seen it happen like what you just said, because I've seen it happen so many times. I just wasn't able to like eloquently express it. But like from the boot camp I graduated from, there's a lot of companies who get really excited. They're like, oh, my gosh, black and brown people that learn to code. And then like a couple months later, they fire us. And it's not because we're bad. It's just you didn't have mentorship or support and or we quit because of that reason. Like, oh, you owe us. Like, we, we did you a favor. No one would have hired you. First of all, people would have hired me. You just happened to be one that I thought I would have a great time at, but apparently not. <laughs> not. Yeah. And it's so easy for an organization to look at the and blame the quality bar rather than look at their own internal organization and say, what did we do to contribute to that? That requires amount of ownership, accountability, and just that growth mindset and the potential to learn. Um, They, you know, make it psychologically safe. Like um, I'm doing this program called All In and we're doing a pilot. Roselle is aware of it, but I go to the students all the time. Like it's a pilot and it's so many fits and starts and all this, but I made it so that, I need y'all to email me when we get on your nerves, when we're not doing something you need, where you're about to quit this program. Give me that feedback all the time and allow me the opportunity to address it. And I'm willing to take that constructive criticism. Rizal slacked me the other day and like, Demetrius, hey, like, here's some things that's going sideways right here. And I, what did I do, Rizal? Like, I'm getting on the phone with you first thing Sunday morning. Yes. And I listen and I say, okay, let me make some tweaks and changes to it based on that. Yeah. But like I said, a lot of people, a lot, especially organizations, especially those in high growth mode, they're not willing to take that step back and really look and understand what's happening there. It's easier to just throw the quality bar thing. Out. Yeah. Right. And the quality bar is such a, like, it's a myth, right? Mm-hmm. Because really... Anytime I hear that, I'm like, oh, you're telling on yourself because it's not even just having the infrastructure to support junior devs or, you know, junior black and brown devs. Even that is absolutely necessary. But also it's also absolutely necessary that your managers know how to manage. Oh, yeah. And that's a separate skill from being really good at whatever your section it is uh-huh. you manage, right? Yeah. And so a lot of times what ends up happening is, you know, a lot of tech companies or even open source communities or tech communities want, oh, I want my community or my organization to be more diverse. And they bring a bunch of people in. However, the environment is not suitable because the people who are already in the environment 
don't know how to be inclusive. Yeah. So if you end up with a manager who's never managed a person of color, never managed a queer person, never managed a black person, doesn't have the same life experience. So they don't even understand and are speaking to you in a way that totally isolates you or alienates you. You're not going to have a good working relationship. And that's outside of tech. That's any management thing. Yeah, and yep. so I feel like that's a piece that's lost on a lot of companies, not just tech companies when it comes to diversity issues and community organizers and managers, which is you've got to also have leadership and management training. And that comes to like that accountability piece that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely unconscious bias training throughout all of it. Like even with this program that we're doing all in, the hiring managers for each of these teams, we want them to actually go through training as well because there's nothing worse than you being a part of a program that's meant to um, increase diversity in tech and then people treating you like you're the diversity hire. Like it comes off yeah. you know, patronizing and all those good things there. Again, like we're doing you a favor. So a lot of times it's that intent versus impact. They probably don't intend to do it. But that's still the impact and how you're making others feel. Yes. Yeah. And I want to add, like, in terms of unconscious bias training, like doing like some real genuine like training, not like those little little videos. And then you call it a day. I'm like, that's not enough training. Come on now. <laughs> no, no. The Adobe Flash movie from 1995. That's not getting it. <laughs> I, I don't know if y'all heard my big sigh over here, but I, I, I won't even like finger snap to all of that. <laughs> I do want to well, ask you another question. And that's about like you're obviously I'm very aware of like your work with All In and your your efforts to increase diversity and equity and inclusion in open source communities. But I want to hear from you. Tell the audience about what you've been up to. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, I have started a new open source community called All In. And it's um, the, the premise of it is to open source diversity, equity, and inclusion. The mission is to do that focusing on access, community, equity, and data. And here's why we, we thought about open source and diversity and inclusion. If you think back to software development 30 or so years ago, it was very much Everybody doing it in silos. All of the companies were like hiding behind patents and copyrights. They didn't want to share code. You know, it was your competitive advantage. If somebody knew what the back end or front end I don't know, of that code looks like, <laughs> then that, you know, significantly reduces our value. And so what ended up happening was somebody said, you know what, there's a different way to do it. If we collectively work on this together then we can actually have even better code, even better products, even more innovation. And so that's how open source was created. Now, fast forward, I started talking to people in open source earlier last year, again, talking, talking, talking to as many as people as I could. And what I saw was that people were working in silos, lots of efforts, lots of resources, money being thrown around, lots of training that you all were talking about, but no one was sharing strategies. It was almost like if I share my strategy with you, you're going to then steal my strategy and go after that tight, talented, you know, that we know is a fable, but that tight, talented pool and we're going to lose our competitive advantage. And that just started sounding very similar to me to how software development was done before the advent of open source. And so I just thought about it. I said, well, if we collaborate on code, why can't we collaborate on inclusion? Yeah. Like it just started with a question. And so that's what All In is meant to do is bring together an open source community. So we are now collaborating on inclusion together. Like we're all in. And I can tell you, when I started talking to people and saying, I want to get companies together where we're starting to discuss talent openly, where you might not be a good fit for my company, but I think they'd be a good fit for your company because you have these things. Like you're more focused on AI and that's what they really want to do. We're more focused on, you know, this thing right here. So if you got any talent over there that you think would be better fit because of what we do as a company, bring them over here. And so everybody was like, there's no way you're going to get companies to do that. Well, I had seven that said, actually, we will. And so that's what we did for All In. Um, we're on 12 months, a 12-month pilot where first thing we're going to do, 
and we've already done is we've executed the open source DEI survey. That's the largest, most comprehensive survey across the open source industry. Everybody was using data from 2017. I was like, we need some more data. We don't even know what progress is. Yeah. We don't know how we're going to measure ourselves. We don't know what are the areas of opportunity that we need to be focused on. So we launched that. That's executed did it in partnership with the Linux Foundation. Then we also did a maintainer's listening tour. You know, you all were just talking about those trainings. I'm not a big fan of big corporate trainings, right? I don't know if I'm talking myself out of future employment opportunities, but whatever. I'm not a big fan of those that go out to everyone. I'm more tactical. Diversity and inclusion, inclusion really happens at that team level. Yes. It's that day-to-day interactions within your team. So I can go watch that training once a year, but and feel good about it for a couple of days. But if I go back to my team and that's toxic and is not inclusive communications and all those good things, you're not going to be moving the needle at all. And so using that manager is who's responsible for creating that culture inclusion with the team. That's the same thing that we've heard about maintainers and community leaders for open source communities. They are the ones that drive the inclusive culture within their communities. And so we wanted to hear from them. What's in the way? What's working? What's not working? What are the challenges? What they need to see? What support do they need? Because if we don't get it where they feel comfortable with doing and they know how to drive it, it's never going to happen across the entire industry. So that's why we did the maintainers listening tour. And the third part where I was talking about earlier is we did a 12-month pilot called All In for Students, where we went to those smaller universities, those ones that companies usually don't go to because it's not an ROI, and we got students from there. And we focused on students that they just needed a shot. Yes. Like going back to the iron for potential. Like we know that your GPA sometimes isn't indicative of your ability and aptitude to succeed, especially in tech. Yeah. You have so many people that don't even have undergraduate degrees, right? But what happens when you have that student that is commuting two hours to, to school every day because they can't afford to live on campus? Their full-time caregivers are at home taking care of their grandparents, especially during a pandemic. Full-time parents, military, um, you know, active duty militaries, that's how they're affording to go to school. Um, you have people that are on um, scholarships, like they're there on athletic scholarships and they actually have to train during the summer. So they can't actually do an internship and never had the opportunity to do a summer internship. Right. But these are those hardworking students that come to school every single day, but life happens. Yeah. We wanted those students, those that just needed a shot that we knew that if we just cracked that door open a little bit for them that they're going to take off and succeed. And we didn't do an application process. Like anybody can write a good essay, right? Like if you know what I mean. And who has the time and the privilege of being able to actually do these essays? So we actually went to the schools and said, look out in your classrooms, look out in your courses. Who needs a shot? And whoever they sent to us, these schools, that's who we accepted into the program. And so we are working with these students um, during the fall semester. They got introduction to open source, open source curriculum through the Linux Foundation. This semester, they're doing 12 week open source projects through Major League Hacking, one of our partners. They are getting paid for the entire thing. So they didn't have to worry about work and all those things. We gave them resume training. Rizal was on a career panel with them so they could understand his career, yeah. uh, you know, different career options and opportunities for them. And the whole goal is that all students during this pilot will get a summer internship with one of our corporate partners. Again, these are companies that never step foot on these campuses. And now they are expand. This is how you expand the talent pool. This is how you make an impact. Yes. Now, I can tell you, It has been a labor of love. I love every last one of them students, but we went all in. That was the name of the, we named it this for a reason. So if someone needs more interview training and coaching, we're getting it for them. If they all of a sudden, like we had someone that, um, you know, actually was in a very bad car accident and and then concussion protocol, like over Christmas and all those things. And she said she couldn't do this semester. Because, you know, it was going to be like, she's like oh, a month before she's up under the concussion protocol. A lot of programs were like, oh, you can't do the hour. Sorry, let's move on. But we went and met with her university professors and they said she's still showing up to class every day, even when she shouldn't be. I said, we're going to figure out how to make this work for her. 
we're going to do a project at the end of the semester when she's better for her, just for her. And so if we have to pay a little bit extra to do that with our partner, we'll do that, even though they haven't even asked us for anything extra. Yeah. So we are going to meet the students where they are and just give them every chance to succeed in all those things. So that's what All In is about. Really exciting about it. Anybody that wants to learn more about it, go to allinopensource.org. Yes, please do. <laughs> I love it. That is like, you're like, meet them where they are. That is the harm reduction way, but also talking about, you know, a lot of people have these programs like this, but they don't provide the wraparound services. And that's what you're talking about. And the wraparound services is usually what is needed the most. If you're not taking the pressure off those sort of activities of daily living and those survival things that people have to deal with, you cannot get to these other pieces that you're trying to do within your program sometimes. And so many people miss that. Mm -hmm. So it's so wonderful to hear that y'all are thinking about that with all in open source. That is fantastic. I know you have to get out of here, but any last words before you go? Well, for one thing, I love that you all are in this space and you're doing this podcast. Um, Something that you're starting to see a lot more of, it seems like companies, especially tech companies, are like, oh, wait a minute. Our developers, our audiences, our potential customers, they are starting to be a lot more diverse, whether it's generational, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's race gender, sexual identity, orientation, and all those things. And so now there is more of a push that we have to hire people that can reach people where they are. Yeah. And so you all are, have a demographic and you have a platform and I am loving the way that you are using it. And I want you to continue to give that opportunity to others as much as you can. Like we have to reach and we have to give back. Um, I told Rizelle, she, I hope I can put it, you put it on Twitter. So I think it's okay. She was like, I'm scared. You know, I've been doing all these video um, presentations. I'm scared of, you know, going public. I was like, well, we're getting on the stage together at All Things Open. Yeah, I'm excited. (laughs) So make sure that you are using your platform and just helping so many others. So I am delighted to be here. And anytime you want to hear me kind of, you know, talk, talk, talk a lot. I am so here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much for coming, Demetrius. <laughs> That's all the time we have for today. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you would like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Lois Ren. That's L-O-W-I-S-R-E-N. This show is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor in developer-first startups. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com.